of the hour, I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started here so that um, we can get to the main events. My name is Basil Tigoff. I'm part of the NAGT GSA organizing committee. Um, and today we're going to follow up on Tuesday's webinar um, on virtual worlds. Um, the people we have with us are Jackie Houghton and Mark Helper. But we're also joined by um, Claire Gordon, who has worked with um, Jackie on some of the virtual world stuff. So the uh, um, I'm going to just, this is much more informal than um, the Wednesday session. Please go ahead and turn off your videos to save uh, bandwidth um, for everybody but the, or, um, the presenters. Um, we will if you put your message in the chat, so the chat's on the bottom part, and just go ahead and write your questions, then we will, uh, whoever's not speaking, um, and Claire will also be helping with this, will be able to answer those questions. Um, and if you want to ask a, 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 an oral question, that's also fine. Uh, you can either say, I would like to do that, or just go ahead and unmute yourself and use a pause in that. So this is relatively informal. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start with Mark. Thank you, Basil. I don't know how many of you were able to attend the Tuesday set web webinar, but um, as part of how I've used these landscapes, I've developed some exercises around them that I've used to teach geologic mapping. And <clears throat> I've used two in particular, um, Lighthouse Bay and Three Rivers Hills, one is a very simple, the first one's quite a simple exercise uh, to generate. The second one is not so simple. Um, and some questions that were, that had come up um, in, that we didn't get to on, on Tuesday involved exactly how would you design an, an exercise around these. These are um, <clears throat> available as these wonderful virtual landscapes with outcrops on them and um, but I, I wanted to develop some instructions on uh, how my students should use these to, to make maps. And so I began by looking at some objectives. For my students, it was their first mapping project. We, we had, of course, like everybody else, were canceled. Our field trips were canceled after the pandemic began and we had to come up with online alternatives. And my students had, hadn't done any mapping at that point. And so this was their first opportunity to make a geologic map. And so my goals were pretty basic. I was looking for, uh, them to learn what mapping was all about, how to record information on a, a, a base map, <clears throat> uh, what kind of strategies they might have in order to collect the information while in the field, and then how they could interpolate or how they could um, <clears throat> project limited amounts of information through areas where there was no exposure, where there was cover, the kinds of things we do, of course, in the field. And so my, my objectives before I started were pretty clear. I had about four things I wanted them to work on be able to do and my approach to designing exercise simply involved um, starting with the virtual landscape and the base maps i've listed actually a couple of uh, resources there in the chat window i'm talking right now about the base mouse the base map for lighthouse bay the virtual landscape and there's a link to that there and then the, the virtual landscape itself can be run in a web browser <laughs> and uh, chrome it doesn't work very well or at all Internet Explorer, but Chrome and, and Safari and a few others work fine. I found that Chrome worked best. But anyway, we, we can open that virtual landscape software and maybe I'll share my screen now if uh, we want to look at that. So my first step in creating an exercise was to actually browse the landscape and I'll open this up now. And these are wonderful 3D models that uh, we can navigate through. There's, as I said before, GPS available and a compass that we can pop up on screen. There's some directions on how to do that to know which way we're looking. And our, our goal then is to create a base map from, from the base map that we have to create a geologic map by looking at outcrops that are dispersed across the landscape by navigating to those and then so I'm just now walking it may look a little jumpy for you unless you're running it yourself on your own browser 
for it to go through Zoom like this usually produces a pretty jumpy screen. But I'll tell you, it runs very smoothly in your, on your own computer, much smoother than it would in Zoom. Anyway, here's an outcrop I've just walked to up here. And we simply click on that outcrop and we see a field book. This is true for all these virtual landscapes. There'll be a field book at these outcrops. It provides strike and dip information, a description of the lithology. And of course, we can know exactly where that is by looking at the GPS and plotting that location on a base map. <clears throat> so the process then simply involves waiting for the jet to go overhead. Process would involve simply navigating the, the landscape to collect the outcrop information and plot it on a map. And then from there, try to extrapolate where those contacts between rock units, and there are four, I believe, four or five rock units in this particular map, which are uniformly dipping to the north at about 22 degrees. So it's quite simple map pattern, how they do that. And those were my objectives and that's how I, that's how I was able to start. Um, so let's see if I can pull up the chat window here. As I said, this was quite a simple exercise uh, for students to do. And uh, the most difficult part of it was the introduction of, of strike lines. I wanted some way for them to be able to map contacts across the rivers and, and, and the hills, projecting them um, <clears throat> fairly precisely using the strike and dip data that were available. And so I introduced the concept of structure contours and what we call strike lines in order to map these context more precisely as part of the exercise. And that introduced uh, the last bit of complexity that they had to deal with before they turned in a finished product. So that was my approach to designing exercise. The, the other exercise I did was at a second landscape called Three Rivers Hills, Three River Hills. And it, it involves quite a bit more complicated geology. It's the same kind of layout with a, a three dimensional landscape that they navigate they have to cross the rivers on bridges and they have to find their way around the landscape and discover the outcrops. My initial uh, mapping exercise here at Lighthouse Bay had a base map that had the outcrops located so that they only had to navigate to those. They didn't have to discover them. The second exercise, I allowed them to discover all the outcrops themselves and plot them on the map as they discovered them along with the strike and dip information and the color coded rock type. Uh, that particular mapping exercise has uh, a normal fault, um, fairly simple stratigraphy includes a normal fault, and then um, a ductal shear zone or a thrust fault <coughs> that inverts the stratigraphy in the foot wall of that is an overturned syncline, and in the hanging wall are lower and higher grade metamorphic rocks which have fabrics in them. Uh, the fabric is developed uh, uh, with proximity to that thrust fault. So, there's a cleavage to work with, there's bedding to work with, there's a, a large overturned syncline to work with, with overturned bedding. Uh, so a much more involved exercise. <clears throat> um, and the students found that of course more difficult, but having done this first exercise, uh, they were able to master the, the navigational components and the plotting components quite well and moved on to, to worry about how to interpret the geology more than just record it. <clears throat> I think uh, Jackie has offered some some other ways these landscapes can be used in her her PowerPoint that she used on Tuesday. Some fairly simple questions. You can this can be as simple as talking about um, variations and why the, the, there's a correlation of the, the vegetation with the rock type in this particular exercise that I didn't even bother to use. Uh, but there are other approaches you could take with these landscapes that wouldn't necessarily involve elaborate mapping projects. Uh, the correlation of topography with the three-dimensional aspects, the use of GPS to plot coordinates on maps, um, <clears throat> the use of strike and dip data, how it's recorded. Um, there's lots of ways we you could you know take small bites out of these landscapes and use them for small self-contained exercises that wouldn't involve full-blown mapping. So I think I would like to take some questions at this point if people have them. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen here.
so I can see the, the chat box. <clears throat> so again, go ahead, please go ahead to use the chat box, but also at this point, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just ask questions directly. Mark, Jürgen Adam here from, from Royal Holloway, uh, UK. Uh, I listened to your recording because I did miss the seminar, um, but you mentioned you did these exercises with, with students uh, with, without any previous experience uh, in field mapping successfully. That's correct. The students have, uh, as part of my field class, there are labs every week, and so we had begun to work with synthetic geologic maps in labs. The notion of structure contours and strike lines had been introduced the week before. Um, they had done a little bit of interpreting uh, maps and drawn cross sections from synthetic, small synthetic, simple maps. But this was their first experience of doing any, making a map, yes. And most of them with proper instruction were able to get uh, a satisfying result so that they were really intrigued by, by uh, doing this? Yes, I was very pleased, uh, not so surprised, but actually very pleased at the results. Uh, had some excellent work. Um, and then the full range of other things. I, I think the experience is very much like from, from the kinds of mistakes people make and from the questions I had, experience is very much like what it would be if they were in the field for the first time. Uh, so I think this, these exercises, uh, the landscapes do a very good job of emulating what we see uh, with beginning students in, in the field for the first time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark, we've got a question about running them on Macs. Um, I know you had some issues with that. Uh, would you like to sort of describe your, the process that you use? Was it a crossover app or something? Well, so we should explain that um, <clears throat> these, these uh, virtual landscapes of which there are four, I believe, is that correct, Jackie? Is it three or four? Uh, there are three mapping ones, and then you've got a geological maps and a topographic map or block model ones. So the, the, the one that I just demonstrated, Lighthouse Bay, uh, runs in a very, very robust, runs in a web browser. Uh, Chrome works the best. Nobody has to download the software. We had 54 students running everything from Macs of all vintages to PCs and laptops of all sorts. And I had all 54 students uh, Everybody successfully, no problems, ran the Lighthouse Bay exercise in the web browser like I just demonstrated so that they could look at a Zoom window at the same time that, uh, and receive instruction at the same time they were running the software. The Three River Hill software is a little, a little different. It's, as I understand it, the oldest of the virtual landscapes that Jackie and her team developed. And it's, it does not run in a web browser anymore. So you download that as a standalone program, an executable file. It's designed, it's a 32-bit program that's designed to run in Windows. <clears throat> and uh, there is a Macintosh version also uh, that you can download. That Macintosh version runs very well on machines that are pre-Catalina operating system, uh, with the caveat that you have to kind of override all the security, uh, the, the safeguards that Apple installs so that you, you know, so you don't catch a virus on your computer. You have to turn a lot of that off in order for you to be able to run the executable Mac version that's there. If you're running Catalina, <clears throat> that's the newest as I understand it. I'm not a Mac user, but that's the most recent operating system for Macintosh. That's designed to run 64-bit software only. And so this, the Mac version does not work in Catalina operating system on Macintosh. So our solution was to to download and install on Macintosh's a free um, <clears throat> software package called Crossover, which is one way in which you can uh, run Windows applications on Macintosh's. Uh, there's a, a free 14-day license you can find on for Crossover. And with Crossover and by disabling a lot of security on the, on the Macintosh, uh, we were able to successfully run um, <clears throat> Three River, River Hills, the executable files for Three River, River Hills. And it was a little bit of work, uh, but I, I was fortunate to have a teaching assistant who was a Mac user who wanted to, to figure this out. And so he actually created a short video on how to install Crossover and use it with Catalina. 
on a Mac, uh, and that I posted that video as part of the resources for that second virtual landscape exercise. Those were those resources were distributed uh, as a handout, so to, so to speak, from the first webinar that has URLs for where you can find my teaching exercises. This was for the second exercise, and that included a video of how to <coughs> how to work around um, running Free River Hills on a Macintosh with a Catalina operating system. So other questions? Um, is it possible to design a project around cross sections along a specific line profile in the area? So I did, and I didn't speak about what the deliverables or what the students turned in for that exercise. It was in the case of Lighthouse Bay, it was simply the map a stratigraphic column, an ordered stratigraphic column, and a symbol key for the more complicated Three River Hills with an overturned syncline, a thrust fault, and a normal fault. We did create a cross section perpendicular to strike. Um, and I've posted those templates for cross sections if you, if you want to use them. Uh, and yes, there's, there's adequate strike and dip data, there's beautiful surface outcrop control, so you can create a very precise uh, cross section from from these, these uh, virtual landscapes. And it could have been done for, for Lighthouse Bay, but I wasn't prepared to have the students do that because I, it was the first time around. If I were to do it again, I would probably ask for a cross section, that little Lighthouse Bay exercise. Yeah, so the, the cross section template comes from the topographic base map, which is available for each of these virtual landscapes. And you can simply generate a line of uh, section and, and draw a topographic profile. I provided those uh, to students so they didn't have to burn a lot of time creating topo profiles. I was just getting the links from last time to uh, answer the question um, that you can put up there about resources. So um, if you keep talking, Mark, I'll find those links. Um, right. Those would be the CERC site links. So um, I'll, ask, I'll defer the question about what it costs to create these models. Um, and Spanish version, I think Jackie's more prepared. So I'm just, I'm a, I'm a university instructor or user. I, I haven't been involved in the development of these wonderful resources at all. Um, I'm just very fortunate and very, you know, <clears throat> grateful for this stuff. This, 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 these are out there for us to use. Uh, Jackie and her team are responsible for developing these things. Yeah, I can chip in about the cost. Um, the main cost there is, is actually staff time. Excuse me, I'm going to cough now. I've started speaking. <laughs> um, so to some extent, we did these in our free time, just sort of staff development time that we had to work on stuff ourselves. Um, we had grants to cover us for some of the time. And if you're going to make the landscapes publicly available, you also need a license for the Unity software, which varies depending on the size of your institution. So there are costs involved, but they tend to be mainly to do with the time. Jackie, can, can I ask a question uh, regarding this? Because I was listening to explanations uh, for preparing these models in, in the recording. And I was wondering, in at Royal Hollow, you're not going to really appreciate the, the problem students are going to have until you try to, to do the exercises yourself. And there are several things that you will do to discover in, in that process. Um, so that's the first thing. And then, you know, I started with, as I said, with some objectives. And as I did the exercise myself, I began to think about not just the problems they were going to have, but how could I, you know, sort of exploit what was there um, most effectively to allow them to be successful. I've got a pretty good sense of what my students are capable of at that, that point in the class. And so I, I could have made things more complicated and more easy, but tried to gauge uh, what they were capable of uh, when we first started. I've taught field geology in the field for over 35 years and with beginning students and with an intro class and for a summer field camp, like many of you, I'm sure, so have a pretty good sense of what students, uh, where they struggle and where they have issues and what they need to learn pretty early on. And so that's what guided my thinking when I developed these, uh, these exercises. Um, 
So I just posted the links to um, the materials I used to present online. I mean, the, the whole teaching online experience is, is presents its own challenges, of course. And I was totally new to that when I started and um, discovered that, like many of you I'm sure have, that it's best to work in small sessions, a short session. So I tried to limit my, um, <clears throat> my presentations to sort of 15 to 20 minutes maximum and then gave the majority of time for them to work on things sort of for about an hour and broke that up uh, to begin another 15 or 20 minute Zoom session with the group. We had breakout questions. We did some polls to figure out how people were doing. Um, they had uh, assignments to ask or they had some short videos to watch and just kind of break things up so that it wasn't just a full uh, eight hours of me talking at them or them working on things without any help. <clears throat> Um, does that help? Is there anything else I could answer about designing materials or teaching in particular? Sorry, I'm just seeing somebody saying a uh, page is not found. Um, sorry, try, trying to read chat on that at the same time. Does anyone else have any questions for Mark specifically on you know running the exercises because um, if not I can just talk a little bit around how to make a world. Um. Mark could I ask you quickly this is Randy Russell Boulder Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, I work with both uh, university level and sort of K-12 level educators and I'm more um, astronomy and atmospheric science background, but I'm finding this very intriguing as a potential tool to do like introductory level geology type things at you know the K-12 high school, maybe even middle school level. I'm curious if you have any thoughts there, what might be appropriate exercises. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me that the learning how to read topographic maps could work well at that level as well. And it's, it's brilliant to be able to switch between the sort of photorealistic view and the overlaid topo view. But anything else that you could mention, I guess, just even around the, the notion of the fact that rocks continue underground and, you know, have layers there and stuff and, and how you might approach that or any other really simple basic topics that you think might be worth investigating at, at sort of that introductory level. And I imagine some of that's not too far from introductory level, non-majors, geology courses in, at the university level. So thank you. Any insights you have would be great. So I, I'm going to speak, uh, probably Jackie can do a better job at this, but I'm just, I was not, I did not use, she has other modules that um, allow for, they're probably better for learning how to read topographic maps and to look for what kinds of map patterns you see over landscapes, uh, depending on the strike and dip of rock units. Some block models uh, that are really nice to, to, for students to, to use to visualize uh, what uh, surface uh, traces of rock units look like if they're in different orientations. And so those are wonderful. Um, they're standalone products. Um, they're not the kind of uh, things we're talking about right now in terms of virtual landscapes. You're not browsing. You're not. You're not running around or, or you know, navigating through the landscape, you're looking at these various orientations and, and you can tip the blocks in various ways. I think Jackie should maybe mention uh, what she's used those for. I've not used them. The, um, you talk about the geological map models. Um, I was trying to see if I could find one quickly just to show people about what they look like. Um, oops, okay, just give me a second. Oh, uh, I'm hoping people can see the slide um, that I put up the other day on the geological uh, block models. Um, this seems the quickest way of showing people um, what we do with them. So we've got two different versions, one where you can change the strike of the dip. Um, this is just on a, you just click the keys of one to six. Um, to go through a selection of different dips and um, again uh, a version that changes the strike 
uh, by 45 degrees each time. Um, we use those um, by asking our students to see if they can create like their own outcrop pattern rules. So, you know, do they notice that the, uh, as you, the, sorry, the apparent change in thickness as the dip changes, you know, can, can they sort of work that out for themselves? Um, can they come up with anything like the being in the valleys um, type, um, you know, looking at the outcrop patterns like that. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, um, but it is about thinking what's going on underground. Jackie, could you maybe show him also the, the topo um, model that you had? You've also got a topo, I think your slide before, there it is. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's the topographic map one. Um, so it is all really about dealing with surface data, but thinking about what's going on underground. Um, so I'm not quite sure where you're going with that um, mm -hmm. question, whether it was about predicting what's underground or actually what see, seeing what's underground. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, just, just sort of trying to get I ideas for really introductory level things that some of these tools would be useful for. And um, so thank you. I have a quick question. I think, well, it's probably not quick, um, about practical uh, use of these things. I started playing with them immediately and I agree that the Topo 3D geologic map and Three River Hills work really well right off the bat on a Mac. And then, uh, and then I ran into the Mac problems. Um, and, and I'm seeing something uh, like something I download a file that's called Roskill in capital M and it says use only on Mac and, and I'm kind of curious <clears throat> what the workflow is to actually downloading this software. Where do I go to get it and then what the process is to feeding these maps into it um, offline. Yeah. Right, so it's kind of two, two different things there. There's what you're downloading. Um, you know, for, from our website kind of things. So you should, um, you can download a specific Windows version or a particular, you know, or specific Mac version. Um, those are created within the Unity software itself. It's how we sort of produce the files at the end. You can produce a Mac version, we can produce a Windows version. Um, so that's what you're seeing uh, with those. Our problem with Three River Hills is it's now so old because we've created probably five or six years ago altogether, um, is that the software is obsolete that we used to make it and we can't actually go back in and produce another version of it, um, which is where what Mark was saying about the, um, you know, finding like something like the crossover app um, was, was needed. Um, so there's a third, I think it's a 32 bit Mac version for Three Rivers Hills, but not the, I think the 64 bit that's needed. Where do we download um, that part, though? Um, you know, I, I have your stuff, but I'm looking for the, the machine that I want to throw your stuff into. Where does that come from? Sorry, do you mean the software we've created, the Unity? The, no, the downloaded, the downloaded engine that runs your world. Cross, the crossover. It's, it's, it's a third party uh, app called Crossover, <clears throat> and you can Google that. But I've also provided a link to that in um, my teaching resources, the second one there that I've listed in the chat window is the Three River, River Hills teaching resources and there's a video on how to install Crossover, how to get it running, also some tips on, on uh, shutting off the security um, settings for the Mac. So Crossover is like Parallels or VMware? Not quite, but okay, something but quite similar, idea. yeah. <laughs> okay, well I'll, maybe again I'll just put this out there. If anybody else has some luck getting the um, Three River Hills and uh, Roskillen uh, running. I'd love to hear what what it what happened, how it worked, because I'd like to look at Ross those Collin. as well. So I had about Ross Collin, um because that's a new one, and it has been, um, you know, that that's one. Literally, the Mac version was created in the last few weeks because it's one we've run as a, a an exercise for our students. Sure. Um, so it might be worth re-downloading. I don't know. Um, well, when I click on it, I, I see I get a video, right? Oh, I know where you. The yeah, on the website, part of it is just a little video. There should be um, behind that or with that, there should be a, a link to download material. Um, yeah, the, the issue with the Ross Collin one is that it's quite a detailed world with quite a lot of um, assets in it, in effect. And when we try to put it online on the web, in the same way we 
we had done with the previous ones, we ran into some fairly major memory problems with it. I don't so, see a link for it though, a direct link that would allow me to get to the actual world rather than the video. The sh you, you can't actually run the world through the browser for Ross Collin, unfortunately. You can only run it by downloading the zip files. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Hmm. Right. I'll leave you guys alone. Sorry, too many questions. Thank you. You guys are great. That's all right. So I was just going to try and share my screen, but it's, it's now not working on me. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah. So here's, here's the screen. Um, I'll just share mine real quickly. Yeah. I was going to say it's mine up there now. I've just put, oh, if you that's click fine. I'll put you do it. That's fine. This is what you yeah, get. It's just, get those, it's just those things. links right there. Yep. And the Mac version. Um, I hope Got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was a little disconnected on how it actually goes together. Thank you. I would and also I'll just say, say that. that sorry, Go none, ahead, none of the team who are working on this project actually have a Mac themselves. So if you do find problems with the Mac one, it's worth sort of reporting them to us because we might be able to do something about them. <laughs> it's always worth a go. Okay, thank you. I, I was going to say that the Three River Hills exercise does present some challenges um, for students with Macs to get, to, to get it up and running. I think I had over uh, slightly over a dozen students that had Catalina running on a Macintosh and we spent some time with them getting them started. But I'll, I'll say it's well worth the effort. The, the, the virtual landscape there is really rich and for geologic use it's, it's uh, spectacularly good. There's lots of things you can do with it. Um, I've got some suggestions in my exercises, but I'm sure there's many more things you could do. Uh, you could plot data on staring nets. I didn't do that. Um, we created cross sections, of course, but we didn't pay much attention to cleavage bedding relationship, which you can look at. There's a number of really good, realistic um, geometric relationships there that are fun to, for students to learn to use. Mark, you might be in the best position to answer Wendy's question about um, using them at the high school level or NGSS, or maybe Jackie knows about high school use. Um, Mark, do you have any experience with that? I, I don't. I, I would guess again that Lighthouse Bay, because it's it's so easy to run and, and so accessible, that is probably where I would start. And um, I don't know at what level, um, you might adopt um, my exercises or if you would you know, want to use your own. Go ahead, Wendy. Actually, let me clarify. When I posted it in the chat, there was a gentleman that was just speaking about his possible use with high schoolers and I didn't catch his name. So I was just putting it out there. Was he in a state that uses next generation science standards? Because I think that this might address the dimension that involves modeling that those particular curricula uh, need. So, but thank you. <laughs> There's a question there from Scott White. Um, it says, um, have you tried any exercises with students that did not work? Um, <laughs> so it's a matter of degrees, right? It's uh, No, I had nothing that totally failed. I'll say that right up front. I, I, of course, I, every time I teach something for the first time, I learn about how better to, to modify uh, <clears throat> my approach. And I think I certainly learned quite a bit teaching these two. Think some things work better than others. I don't think anything completely failed. I was just going to say on the name, it's Ross Collin. Ah, yes. It's Welsh. Um, the H is silent in the, in the name. Um, shall I just go over creating a world in Unity now? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, so I've got sort of four PowerPoint slides that I'll just talk through and then people can ask questions around that. Um, Mark, there is one that perhaps you could uh, look at from Anya about uh, designing an advanced field course exercise because Three River Hills, I would say, was fairly advanced. Um, so um, maybe I'll leave that one with you. Okay. But I'll share my screen and um, just do these slides. Well, fairly quickly on that question, I, um, I participated in NGT's uh, designing uh, virtual field course, uh, uh, virtual field trips this, this spring, and, and we had a sp sp special section on advanced, more advanced uh, things that were appropriate for sort of uh, 
capstone projects for field camps and such. I don't, I wouldn't say, you know, from my perspective and the way I teach uh, field camps and what kind of things we do at the advanced level that there is maybe anything perfect for that. I, I have not done the Ross Collin exercise. I think it probably represents the best, uh, the best example of something that might be used to, in, in lieu of an of advanced field course exercise, sort of a capstone exercise. And I'm looking forward to, to giving that a try. I just simply didn't have time to go through and develop these things. And uh, I had four weeks to present two field exercises and this is, I chose those two and realized the Ross Column was gonna be a lot more time investment than I had. So I'd like to go back to it and, and, and maybe adapt it as you suggest for something that's a little more advanced. I think Jackie's gonna talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Right, I'll tell you what, I'll do how to make a world and then we can have a, a little look at Ross Collin after that, um, if that works for people. So share my screen. Hopefully you can see the PowerPoint slide there. Um, so yeah, so when we sort of looked at creating a world, people want to you know make their own. Uh, the first thing I'd always look at is why are you doing it? What are your learning outcomes? Um, what do you want to achieve? Um, are you going to look at replicating a real world place as we've done with Ross Collin or an imaginary world um, which we've done with Lighthouse Bay and Three River Hills? Uh, it's a real time commitment, as I think Claire said earlier, um, probably at least weeks, uh, maybe even months. Um, you can speed that up slightly if there's a team of you working on it, but um, it really, it is very time consuming. Um, it depends if you've got experience of using either Unity or Unreal game engines. Um, the, if you've got some coding experience, that helps. The size of the world you're trying to create, um, if it's only relatively small, obviously that's quicker. Um, your source and amount of data that you're trying to use. I say source because you're using a real world. Um, you have the advantage of being able to get photographs and such like, and the data is there and you know it works. If you're creating an imaginary world, um, you do have to make up the geology um, and make sure it works. Um, and that's why in our imaginary worlds, you get field sketches in the notebooks, but in the real world, um, it's mainly photographs because actually it's a lot quicker. Um, and again, the level of detail you acquire. Um, with ours, with, you know, with Ross Collin particularly, there's a lot of detail there. You could achieve the same learning outcomes on a much plainer looking uh, landscape. Um, on the software, we've used Unity because that's what we were introduced to. Um, two or three years ago, Unity started charging uh, a license fee, um, which has given us no end of problems, um, sourcing the money to pay for that. Um, Unreal Engine is very, very similar. Um, works, yeah, they, they all work in a sort of similar way, but you can actually uh, download that for free. You can get a free uh, personal license on Unity, I should say, to be fair to Unity. You can get a free personal license, but if you want to put the, um, the resulting landscapes that you create out on the internet, um, as we've done, then you have to have the paid for license. You, you shouldn't uh, do that on a personal license. Um, I've got the screenshot I've got up here is um, of the uh, workbook, if you like, in uh, Unity. Um, we've got a picture of the uh, lighthouse, lighthouse sorry, the Coast Guard hut in the middle um, here. And the little lights you can see here are we're having to sort of specially light it so that you can actually see the um, Coast Guard hut properly uh, in the world. Um, there's all sorts of things going on around the side here. Uh, we've got the little, what I always think looks like Mickey Mouse here, but is actually a camera. Um, that's what you see through, that's your first person um, character as it's called. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can set, the walk speed, the running speed, how high it can jump, uh, how high, how far it is off the ground. Um, that's very much something to consider when you're looking at scale, um, the, uh, that you don't make your, your character too tall because then everything will appear too small. Uh, the, no, it's not worked. Let's try that. Um, what you need is a height map, um, so your topography. Um, ideally, if you can get sort of one meter uh, resolution uh, data, PEM, um, that's the sort of perfect amount. Um, Unity tends to smooth out whatever you put in there anyway, so there's no point in having better resolution than that. Um, if you use your more sort of standard 30 meter resolution, you do get quite 
you lose a lot of details in there. Uh, if you're going to create a world, um, it's really just a case of I drew the contours in Illustrator, in Adobe Illustrator, and then Claire converted to a height map using uh, GIS. Um, you can put that, you put that into Unity Editor. The, the pictures we've got on the side here is that you're converting it. High points are white, the, the lowest points are black. So it's creating um, a sort of grayscale model of the topography. Um, with that topography, you then, um, you need to smooth it. Unity tends to create quite a stepped version of, a, of the topography. Um, and then create what are called your, your landscape textures. So um, this can be like the grass and the gorse and the things that you see, or it can just be a case of putting a map on top of that topography. Um, when you're creating the natural looking worlds, you then sort of paint the landscapes with the different types of textures that the grass, uh, the paths, all that sort of thing, even the tarmac of the road are all um, painted images onto that landscape. Uh, depending how much detail you want to go into, that can be very time consuming. Um, you then populate your world with assets, so things like the Coast Guard hut, um, 3D objects, sky boxes, which is the horizon, the sky that you see, or sound files, um, all those assets, uh, you can get those either from Unity Asset Store, Unreal Marketplace, or you can make your own using 3D um, uh, sort of programs like Blender and, and Maya, um, you can create 3D objects. Uh, basically what you have these are skins that we're seeing here so here's the, the skin of the sheep um, and of the minibus that we use and unity places those round um, a uh, like a grid uh, to create the object um, and again it's thinking about your lighting one of the worlds when we first made it, it had two suns and it took us a long time to work out why um, so there's quite a lot of subtleties in there you need to add the barriers in so that nobody falls off your world into the sea um, because that you know doesn't look good on the risk assessment when you lose students off the edge of a virtual landscape um, then it's about creating your geological data and sketches uh, per, per, you know going notebooks that you see um, we tend to do this on spreadsheets uh, excel spreadsheet and then i think now you can actually directly put that into unity um, it was at one point we were having to copy and paste data into it. Uh, your clickable markers, by, by that we mean these, um, the rocks, rock out crops that you see, or the notebooks. Um, you add the information to these. Um, I could have done with it a sketch of that. So yeah, it's, uh, you put the information, you put those into the world and then add the information to them. Uh, we were talking about a building for required platforms, so for your Mac, uh, or your PC. Um, we only do, we don't do any mobile platforms because you require additional license to create a world for, um, you know, tablets and such like. Um, but anyway, so you, you build, uh, you export your world, you build it for the platform, check that it runs, and as I say, sit back and admire your work and hope that it keeps running and that it works for everybody. So that's a very quick rundown on how to um, build a world. Uh, I haven't kept, kept an eye on the chat, but has anyone got any sort of just direct questions from those, um, for, from what I've said there? It's all gone very quiet until I put everybody off. There was a question about whether this would be a good exercise for students who were um, more digitally inclined, either as a senior thesis or as a master's project. Just given your experience, is that about the right level you'd need to be to do this sort of the activity? I think if you, with students, one of the things that, that we did is that the minibus design, that was actually an MSc um, project for somebody at Leeds Arts University um, as part, I think it was part of her MSc project she designed that particular uh, created that particular asset for us um, if you've got a geology student who is I think it was being asked earlier if you've got a geology student who's very into coding is very comfortable with the software already um, to make a small world uh, would make a great little project um, 
but yeah they have to be comfortable with the software first because there's so many things that you can spend a day sorting out um, because you don't quite know how the software works so i've just got a question there about putting an aerial image in um, the satellite data yeah aerial images tend to be too fuzzy by the time you're actually walking around on top of them um, in a virtual world um, the we've put maps when, when you see the geological map that is um, actually a paper map if you like that's been dropped on top or a digital map that's been dropped on top um, Claire the oh so I've got large-scale photo mosaic um, Claire can I just ask you because I know we have looked at thought about putting satellite images on there um, before. Yeah. Uh, yeah go on. It does tend to smear a bit, um, particularly when you've got a landscape with quite a lot of topography, as it were. Um, it's, it's like trying to put a building on with um, images, you know, it just sort of smears down the side of it. It's, you, we've tried, well, we've tended to use it when we're trying to paint the topography on just so we can get an idea of what we need to paint on top. But it's never been totally successful for just the usual terrain in Unity. Jackie, could I suggest that you maybe show the Ross Collin examples you have of building uh, 3D models that are incorporated in the landscape at this point? Somebody's asking about whether you can, uh, maybe that's a related question anyway using uh, drone imagery or uh, building yeah. 3D models. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was staying at my screen just to bring Ross Collin up there. So I'll just share my screen. What, what I'll show you is, um, sorry, I can't, can't do two things at once. Just to consider, while Jack is doing that, just to continue with the use of the large scale stuff. Where we've put the outcrops in, those have actually been produced by photogrammetry and have actually been produced as models using different software and then just brought into um, Unity, as with what Jack is about to show you. Uh, I'm not sure I'm having difficulty. Can you see it on my screen? Is my screen sharing? Can you see That's it? good, yes. Okay, right. Okay, so, so this is a, um, so I'm now in the Ross Collin um, virtual landscape. And this is one of our um, high-res uh, photogrammetric models that we've put in here. Um, it's it's of a famous area called the Ledge, which is right on the edge of uh, the island. The sea is literally just behind you when you're, in the, uh, when you're there. Um, so I brought this one because this is probably the, the best example we have um, of using um, the sort of 3D models within the world. And you can see a lot of data. Uh, you can see a lot of information on there. Um, there's various little folds. You can see all the sort of folds through the um, as quartz veins folded in there. You can see faults. You can find um, soft sedimentary deformation features. I'm just going to come down to the camera. Uh, in Ross Collin, we also have these cameras that actually show photographs as well. Um, so that's what it looks like in the real life. Um, has the camera, has the photo come up for you as well on next? I know we've got a time delay. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Um, so that gives you the photo that we're looking at. And then, yeah, this is the 3D model itself. And you can just walk around it in the same way that you can um, the rest of the landscapes. But as you can see, you get a great deal more detail Yeah, so I could see designing an exercise around portions of this landscape that would involve sketching, perhaps, or um, uh, there's data in, in field books that talk about the orientations of the hinge lines of these folds and their axial planes. You could do things with, um, with those for a little bit more advanced uh, component to the field mapping. I mean, you could also use this as a mapping exercise, so there's lots of possibilities here, I think. Yeah, 
when we created these worlds, it seemed a great fun idea to have the aircraft flying over um, the, uh, you know, little bit of sort of Easter egg, because um, it's a very common feature uh, in uh, field trips in the UK when you're out in the sort of middle of nowhere for the uh, Royal Air Force to come flying over in a jet and making you jump. Um, having worked with the world for several years now, I seriously regret putting that aircraft noise on because it drives me dark. Although to be fair, there is an RAF base right next door to Ross Column. Um, so it's not unrealistic here. Um, I keep looking up and seeing no jets. Well, they move so fast, you actually have to look, I believe it's 45 degrees ahead of the sound to be able to see a, a um, jet. Yes, there, there are sheep there too, and they do bar. It's very annoying. Um, I got I got quite a few comments um, after our presentation on Tuesday about how many how many people like the dead sheep. I got more comments about dead sheep than I did about anything else. I was very surprised. <laughs> are there dead sheep yeah. in the Roscala landscape? Yes, there is a dead sheep. It's over near the gully. It's quite a walk <laughs> from where I am at the minute, so I won't um, go there because. Uh, I'm trying to work out how to unshare my screen. Right, okay. Um, what was I saying? Yes, that, that was one of the Easter eggs. Again, was putting in a dead sheep in each of the mapping worlds. Um, and it's something, one of the talks I've given on this is called Where's the Dead Sheep? Um, and I have been stopped in, I think it was Vancouver Airport, and went, oh, you're the dead sheep lady. It gives students, actually, there is a reason to it. It gives students something to find. It gives them something to talk about. It makes them laugh. It's part of the immersive experience. So it's not um, a completely silly thing for it to be in there. But I'm seeing lots of dead sheep comments coming up now. It did people, one of the things I meant to say about Ross Collin um, is we do have an additional exercise that our colleague Jeff Lloyd ran only uh, three or four weeks ago. Um, and we had the link up there in our last presentation um, to the material that he used because he used um, the virtual Ross Collin as a 3D setting for uh, his exercise. He's used a lot, he's produced a lot of um, data uh, around it uh, that students can use. It, it's a whole set of exercises um, that he's created based on our field class. Uh, it's quite advanced. Um, it's looking at the sort of progressive um, deformation that you see in the area. Um, so Ross Collin is one of those you can use very simply to map a, um, an anticline or I'll, um, I'll dig out Jeff's um, link in a second and put it in the talk. Um, you can actually do really quite a detailed sort of several day, I think it's about five days uh, field trip uh, in the area. Has anyone got any other questions about making the worlds um, from what I was talking about. So I've just noticed it's five to seven actually, so. Could I ask you a little about the breakdown of the amount of work as opposed to the specific features like you have your pop-up lab mo mo notebooks, how much of the fracture of the work are they? How much is it finding realistic textures for the landscape? How much is it modeling the overall landscape, you know, just different things like that. If someone were to want to do something similar, but maybe have a slightly different mix of features or something just to get a sense of what's really time consuming. And I think you made some mentions somewhere in there that there were some features that you felt were not absolutely necessary for a bare bones sort of version. So anything you could address there. The things like the notebook itself is just um, a 3D object. So that's, once you've made it, that's very straightforward. The time consuming um, elements to it are actually the geology, making sure you've got the data right, putting the data into the format that can go into Unity, um, making sure that you put it in the right place so that your um, GPS reading um, matches that on the map so that students are actually putting things in the right place. Um, the look of the landscape, the painting the landscape with the different textures, that's something you can do. Um, you don't have to make them look as detailed as we do. Um, but again, the geological data you do have to get right because that, that is the whole point of them. Um, so it's you could create a very quick world which is essentially just green um, and 
put some flags in there for data and you still would meet the um, you know spatially distributed data uh, 3d data that is one of the things that the virtual landscapes does so it's creating the geological data and then making the world look look good to make it an immersive experience and then after that i think it's it's dealing with the technicalities of the game engine software um some issues suggest ask about who's creating the world um mainly it's me and claire it's a two of us we're both geologists uh we're not designers uh we're not computer specialists i'm a structural geologist with my background claire well, i'm saying that she started off at um leeds as the librarian um, and has worked her way up to um, using game software. Um, so it's partly the reason why some of our worlds are a bit clunky, is that they are, they're built for geologists by geologists, um, not game designers. Yeah, it's Does, kind of where you never imagined your career going, isn't it really? Um, do, does that help? Does that answer that question? Great. That's, yeah, that's helpful. And unfortunately, the answer is mostly there aren't a lot of shortcuts to get the good science in there. That's the bulk of the work. So, oh, well, <laughs> thank you, though. I mean, that's okay. Teamwork is, is really useful. I mean, there are up to six of us have worked on this, on um, different aspects of different projects. The, the 3D models that you've seen embedded there um, is almost done entirely by a separate colleague, uh, a guy called Ben Craven. So you can spread the, world, the work out a bit um, to speed it up. But uh, yeah, it, it is time consuming. I can't say otherwise. <laughs> so the Thank one you. thing I'll, I'll add to that is that Rick Almendinger has some um, programs that could potentially be used to speed up um, putting in digital worlds. Um, to, to make that possible. So you might use other software and then, and then work with the virtual world context once you did that. So I think um, we're going to declare victory here. Um, thank you everybody, um, particularly Jackie, Mark and Claire for uh, showing us and being willing to talk through your experiences um, and sharing the resources that you have all developed for that. Um, this is concludes the uh, NAGT GSA um, webinar series. Um, this is the last one. If they decide to reinvigorate it, we might do that. But otherwise, this is sort of the official end. So thank everybody for also attending. And um, we will just muddle on with what we do in fall as best we can, given a lot of these great resources that have been developed. So bye now. Thank you for allowing us to